Sibby, thank you so much for jumping onto the Security Space podcast. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm quite excited for this one as well because I'm always excited uh, speaking to anybody that has experience with VC sewing, um, and probably you're uh, an expert in this area. So obviously, the next uh, half an hour we're in safe and capable hands. So as a bit like every other podcast, if you can just give me a quick uh, introduction to yourself, if that's okay. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Hello, I'm CB. I've done a lot of things in my life to various level of depth, uh, but people can say that I'm an expert in what privacy, cryptography, uh, device management for security, and security in general. Now I kind of moved off, you know, when I started off with technology, uh, you know, about what 13 years ago, I decided that that's not where I can make the biggest impact. And I decided that actually focusing on technology will only fix a problem about that size. When we focus on people and what they're doing with that technology, we can probably fix the whole organization. And that's where I started seeing that that's more fun and that's actually makes a proper impact in the world. And that's what I'm doing just now. Okay. And um, just before we, de we, we delve into it, what, what when was the decision for you uh, to move from, you know, being a standard sort of internal CISO uh, to then go, actually, I'm, I'm going to do, uh, take a crack at this VSO in the CISOing work? Yeah, uh, so obviously uh, my LinkedIn is open to, to everybody so you can see, uh, you know, my roles. Technically, I never had a role where HR would call me a CISO, so I want to make it clear. Uh, I'm, I'm not pretending to be somebody who I on paper haven't been. However, I was head of information security for Heineken UK. That's the role that I had before this one. And why would I switch? It's, it's probably goes to my nature a little bit as well. And something that we can talk about later is, is that I believe that organization needs different kind of CISO or different kind of a leader depending on their maturity. And, and once a certain level of maturity is reached, a lot of organizations don't need a full-time CISO. Okay. They need somebody to keep it alive, keep the fire going, keep, you know, make sure that the controls are there and understand what, you know, inputs and outputs they're getting from different teams, supply chain, and so on. But once the whole machine starts to operate and it's operating for a while, you go through one or two cycles of governance working, you're like, Hey, I've, I've done my role. I fixed it. It, it mm. is like you think that it should be. And then you may need a different personality to drive it. Okay. And, and, and that's, a, you know, that doesn't mean I'm a quitter. No, I'm actually a very hard working person on fixing things and making they work, proving they work. And I can continue proving that for a year or two. But after a second year of showing that something works, I'm thinking, okay, that's you know, somebody else can do it. Somebody who who actually likes, you know, keeping the show on the road. Mm. Uh, and I'm more into trying to find solutions to problems, real life problems, uh, and helping people uh, resolve them. Mm. So let me come in on that one. And um, you've teed up very nicely. Why, why would a company hire a VC so as opposed to a C? So what's going on in that in the landscape at the moment where it's like that would probably make sense for us right now so that's a great question and uh i think i've got some profiles of different companies in my head there is more than one reason that a company would hire a vc so there could be companies where they didn't have a security person at all so you can imagine there are still organizations out there that are relatively small maybe you know it depends some people are, you know, an organization of 1,000 people, for many, it's going to be relatively small. They may have had a technologist that dealt with security. They may have had a security person that focused on technology. But they're now realizing that actually they need more than that. They need to actually protect the whole organization. And there is a few different ways they can do it, and they don't know which one is the best. So they could go with somebody just coming in and doing normal type of consultancy, coming in for, you know, three weeks, telling them what's wrong, what to fix. Uh, if, if, if anybody had a chance to watch what Steve Jobs said about consultants, I think it's true about 60% of the, of the consultants that, mm. you know, unfortunately, they're not necessarily 
that bought into the interest of the business and not necessarily supportive enough and, and thinking about the long-term benefit to the business. Where a VC so if they're coming in, obviously their interest is to keep the business running long-term and making the business happy long-term and fixing things for the business. So at the stage where an organization is needing consultancy, understanding what their security response should be to the current you know, threats outside of the organization, they may decide, let's let's go with a VC. So they're going to come in every week for an amount of hours, talk to us about it, do some reviews, work with our teams on the, on the recommendations. So it's not that they're just going to put on the paper recommendations, do A, B, C, and you're going to be secure. Then you take it to your team and the team says, you can never do that in this organization. No. The VC so will actually be there to have those chats and see because often you know recommendations could be wrong. Yep. Recommendations could have not seen something that's actually happening in the organization, and you need that kind of top to bottom and bottom to top view of an organization that you can only gain if you really wanting to put the hours in it. And that's what the VC so should be doing, and we can do it. So that's one thing. Second. You will probably seen that in LinkedIn and you work in recruitment. You you would have seen that, you know, if you look for a CISO, there are and look for the history of you know employment for a lot of those people, you will see that a lot of CISOs don't actually have a background in security. They they've been yeah. a nice person working in an organization for the past 20 years, and they've been trusted enough to start and, and they knew something about computers or knew something about phishing, and the organization decided you are going to be our security yeah. leader. Yeah. And it's great. I'm, I think I'm all for it. But if a person like that needs a bit of coaching and help. And that's where VC so can come in in parallel. They don't need an internal title or can they just be consultant or whatever. And coach the CISO on the job and actually get them to understand the processes, get them to understand the security is a process, and potentially set up the security in the organization for them to run. So that's another story. Um, I think that that's probably the, the majority of the cases. I think we, when we talked about it before, we could split it further on a high level. It's more or less like that. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I've never even thought that a, a VC so could come in to actually assist the full time C. So that's that, that's really interesting. I didn't know about that. Um, just a question on, let's just say, um, I just want to bring you back to, say you're a VC, so going into an organisation where they literally, just, this, they don't have sort of any security posture in there, or, or it's minimalistic, um, but you know that you're only going to be in there, like you say, for, for a few weeks, um, like um, over the course of like maybe six months, X, Y, Z, it doesn't matter about the timeline. My question is, um, do, do you guys bring in a team or because then surely that's your people and my follow-on question is like isn't that where does that leave the company afterwards if do, do, does all your team then go with you or is it just you um how does all that work when you need extra bodies essentially yeah that that's that's an interesting uh question very interesting question so i do have a benefit of a big team to to support me if i need that support so that's uh a good thing you know i what what you need to do when you're going in as a VC so is before you speak out, you need to understand the organization. You need to do enough interviews and enough checks to know what you're talking about. So I would always recommend that the VC so does all the kind of interviews. They may have somebody to go with them and, and train up as you know, even a, a, a junior consultant go in and take notes and help them in gathering all the information, but uh, it's the VC so that should be doing all the interviews. However, there is also technical aspect of it because many organizations do not know their technical security posture. And yeah, we can argue where is information security, where is cyber security. I don't want to do it because I've got a different view than the whole world what cyber security means. And it's okay. I can keep it to myself. It's actually the speed that is not important here. What is important is that technical security, technical elements and configuration, IAM, security monitoring, they all are very important parts of the bigger picture of security of an organization. And I can rely on a team of specialists that have, you know, good technical skills to go in, 
review somebody's Microsoft 365 tenants, go and review their IAM posture, go and review their monitoring, how it's actually done, what rules do they have set up in their team. I've done those jobs before, but it doesn't yep. necessarily mean that on a CISO level, I want to be doing these jobs again and that I have enough time to maintain the skills in them. So I, I initially, I would bring in a team and, and help me to assess where the organization is. And I would use all those signals, including all the signals from the interviews to say, this is the organization, this is the problem you've got today. Let's work on a strategy or a cadence of change. There's always something to change. So there may be a strategy in place already. You may want to rewrite it a little bit. Okay. Uh, so but do you want to start with an assessment? During the, the kind of life of a VC, so I tend to focus on just that one person being the conduit, being the main point of contact. And if there is some improvements needed and the organization is happy with us to deliver it, we can deliver improvements in policies, in configuration, in something else. My team can actually do it, but that's usually as a separate engagement. And, and if the customer wants to go with an other partner to do it, because they think there is you know, it's going to be better. They're gonna, not going to be a conflict of interest. I'm very happy for it. You know, that, mm. that's okay. That's not a problem. There. Mm. The mm. one thing that I really like, though, is I work for an organization that has a huge manage detection response capability and incident response capability. So let's hope my clients do not get into trouble during my VC so engagements. However, if they would, I can, we can ask and about incident response straight away. I've got responders to call, and and unlike VC shows that are kind of single man bands, I yep. have somebody to rely on straight away to help me with managing a technical crisis. Where while I'm trying to work with senior stakeholders managing the business crisis. Yep, and um, you said something very very uh, very interesting there. I just want to pull you back on it, and, and, and I do understand this can be subjective, but. You were talking about strategy and what 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 is a good strategy for a CISO to have? Because it sounds very subjective and, and very dependent on the context of a, of a lot of things. So talk to me about what a good strategy looks like from a CISO's point of view. It's a great question. And uh, what you need to think about is probably all of us, everybody who has been in an organization for more than a few years will know that there is uh, somebody at one stage coming with a big, nice, shiny strategy and saying, this is our new strategy. We are going to be better than our competition. We are going to be known for customer advocacy and we're going to win in each market uh, with, you know, a company A, B and C. And it's like, that's wishful thinking. That's not strategy, honestly. But that's how, you know, somehow people who are on the top of the organization often get away with creating strategies like that. And that's not how to create strategy and that's not how to document strategy. There is a great book about strategies called, uh, easily remember, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Uh, it's yeah. very easy to remember. And then the guy also wrote a book called The Cracks, where he describes his approach to it. And it's actually a very fascinating book. If you don't have enough time for the book, I recommend looking for it on YouTube, good strategy, bad strategy. The guys condenses the whole book into an hour and a half uh, lecture, I think in Harvard. Harvard. Uh, brilliant. How you split the strategy? First of all, analyze your situation. Do a gap analysis where you are as an organization today. Analyze, you know, the market around you. What is going to change there? You know, for, for example, for us, you know, uh, for technologies, information security and everything, you think how the organization is going to change. Is AI going to change something? Is virtual reality going to change something? Augmented reality, is that going to change something? Zero trust and so on. You just think, what, what are those kind of technological but also culture things? E ecology could be a thing, you know, how the organization want to be more green and so on. You need to kind of think where the organization is going, where the industry is going, so you see where you are, you see where you want to be, and you need to kind of then the strategy needs to cover the gap from here to here. Yeah. Uh, once you agree where you're going. So that's first step is agreeing where you want to go. The second step is you need to decide what behaviors will take you there. 
And despite me not being the slimmest person in the world and never having a, a working strategy for a diet, I can assure you that the you know the method there is very similar to thinking about the weight loss. And, and we can use the weight loss analogy or, or gain it to be it. You yeah. want to change your body one way or another, loss or gain. Everybody wants to change the, their body somehow and they understand it. And you now set your target up or down. And you need to do two things. Decide what are the specific actions you're going to take and what are your behaviors to take. And I say the behavior may be that you need to start eating low calorie foods. So a food that is low calories per volume. So you fill up your stomach with something that that if you want to lose weight or they're opposite if you want to gain weight. So that's a behavior. You know you need to do it and you document it as a behavior. And then you need to document, document the action. Your action may be, I am going to eat lettuce every morning because that's going to fill me up and that's going to match up the behavior. And then you create a triangle of those three things. You've done your gap analysis, which told you what you want to do. Then you go to a behavior that tells you roughly your decision making, what you're going to do. And then you say, what's your action? You're going to eat lettuce. But then you go on holiday to a country that doesn't sell lettuce. Yep. So what do you do? You still got your gap analysis. You still got your behavior. And behavior is telling you that to get to where you want to be, you need mm. to eat a, a food that is low in calories per volume. So you find another food that is that and you match your action. That's how they all need to match together. If your actions and behavior don't match the gap analysis, you're failing. So you need to change your gap analysis, decide that you're going somewhere else. And it's a triad. Yeah. And, and you know, do you think we need a cyber example for it as well? Or do you think that the lettuce analogy is good enough? I like the lettuce analogy, but obviously to tie it up quite nicely, yeah, if you can obviously marry that into, you know, maybe a cyber example, that, that could be good as well. Yeah, uh, so so I would say, to, to give an example for it, most of the organizations struggle with one thing, uh, technical debt. That technical debt is, is always there. Uh, so your gap analysis often will identify there is technical debt in the in organization. You need to do something about it. So that's what your behavior may be. Let's start a decommissioning project. Let's start actually create a program of decommissioning work and create you know, new things. And your actions, where you can plan them, because usually with actions is another thing. There is something like planning horizon. You can only plan up to a point in the future, maybe 12 months or so. And beyond that, you, can, you need to rely on your compass and your behaviors to to kind of refresh your actions afterwards. So you may already, when you're writing the strategy, say, okay, as part of the strategy, we already agree that an action will be, we are going to decommission, let's say, our on-premise uh, you know, exchange server. And it's already going to be a, a tangible action that you can accomplish as part of your strategy, matches your behavior and matches your gap analysis. And by just doing that thing, you also, reinforce the strategy in the organization because they're happy they're actually following their strategy they know how to do it that's uh, an element of it yeah and i suppose while we're talking about the commissioning it's you reminded me about the another element that is very important in strategy that most people forget about is you know a lot of people focus when they're creating strategies okay so they're thinking the strategy should be the new things that they should be doing from now on that's not the case. The strategy should cover everything you're doing. Mm. So what do you need to continue doing? What do you need to stop doing? And then what do you need to start doing? So uh, deciding what you need to do is, is very important. Sorry, I just had a bell to my house, uh, That's <laughs> right. no, no which problem. got me distracted. But I, I hope that answered this, this question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. I've always wondered how many sort of clients um, A, can you physically have and B, do you want? I mean, the, the, the third question might be the more the better, but I imagine that gets to the point where maybe not, you need to prioritise a certain time. Um, so, yeah, talk to me a little bit about, about obviously, your, your clients, your time management and, and everything along them lines. Mm -hmm. Good. 
Good, good, good thing to discuss. Uh, obviously, you are in recruitment again. You probably have seen people's CVs, what they say that they're doing, what they're doing, and and I sometimes see that a BCSO would have uh, you know a whole raft of clients in one industry, and sometimes it would be like fifteen or twenty clients under one VCSO just because they are in one industry, and I don't think that that's Feasible. I don't think it's the right level of engagement that the FVC so yeah. should should have. Uh, so I don't go beyond, you know, I don't go below, uh, you know, half a day a week. Half a day a week is minimum that our we can split a, a VC so engagement. I just wouldn't okay. go beyond it. But on the other opposite scale, I wouldn't go to hundred percent with one client because if they want hundred percent of VC source time, they surely they just need a contractor or an employee. And, yeah. and that's a different story. Okay, if they need a VC so to bridge a gap in you know two or three months of somebody not being in the organization, they may want to look for somebody doing it, do, yeah. being being their VC so. But at the same time, I would then say if you look if you really need somebody for 100 percent just go to the contract market. Because yep. you know it's hard for me to then schedule employees, uh, you know, to to go and feel a hundred percent engagement with somebody, and it's not necessarily good for that employee either. I don't believe that sending an employee hundred percent on a client for a long time is good. I don't like doing it. I would much rather have uh, either shorter engagement on hundred percent, fair enough, or an engagement that is not the whole week. So my rule of a thumb that I we implemented is. You know, it's sixty percent of the time maximum on a client for a VCSO engagement, and mm -hmm. even then, a person that does it shouldn't uh, be, you know, doing just VCSO engagement. They should have other engagements so they can keep their knowledge up to date through different forms of, uh, you know, engagement with the customers and potentially addressing things in a slightly different way and having time to train the team as well. Because obviously part of consultancy is making sure that you can train up people all the way from you know a consultant to a senior consultant, principal consultant to becoming a, a senior leader in your organization. So we need to think about how we're bringing people up. So to answer your question, for me, uh, you know, one, two, three VCSO clients per person is probably okay. okay. More than three, it becomes a struggle. You can not remember enough about the, the client to have the context, to have the conversations with the stakeholders and not to confuse them in your head as well. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that makes sense. Do you actually have any sort of client engagement you can actually talk about? Yeah, uh, it, it's hard. Uh, I, I would say every single one of them is special. Every single client engagement that we have on VC so is, is slightly different uh, because the organizations are going to be slightly different. There are some common themes uh, as we probably discuss why people are actually getting a VC so. Yeah. I would probably say let me think about it and we can maybe make another uh, podcast or maybe a few snippets about specifically this. Sounds like a plan. Um, cool. Okay. And last question, Zibi. How how do you become a VC? So, very good question. Uh, and actually, uh, it's, it's it brings me to to something interesting. I actually have seven different roles within my own uh, function. Advertise right now uh, from consultants that may be doing various things. You know, doing some cloud work, doing. Uh, some you know pervy compliance or actually done governance work. I've got senior consultant roles and finally I've got principal security consultants roles. My all of my principal security consultants in, in kind of the advisory space are trained and can do VC so engagements with our clients. We also have uh, people on the senior consulting roles that depending on the size of the organization that will be more than capable and actually beyond what an organization needs in the BCSO space. So uh, certainly, if somebody's interested, they can apply. I would love that. In terms of the journey, and I had that conversation earlier today, we had, uh, I already interviewed two people today that are kind of early in their, in their careers and so on. 
and you know the Finnish university, the, the universities tend to focus still on teaching technical skills. Mm. Which is great. I think everybody who's going into consulting, governance, and things like that would be good if they have a specialty in at least two or three areas of security. But you know, a, if we can probably split security into what ten areas if we want to be detailed enough. And and it's good if somebody has specialties in two or three and has some technical knowledge in 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 some so that translates into understanding how technology works, how computers talk to each other, and so on. So it's important background what the universities teach, but what they often forget to teach is governance. Mm. People don't necessarily know uh, how to assess the whole capability of an organization to protect itself against the basic standard like. NIST cybersecurity framework or even CIS 18 critical controls. So what I would say to any technologists, any people out there that feel that they would want to make a bigger impact on their organizations, then they can you know, go towards more governance, architecture and VCSO roles. But part of it is understanding how organization works. How do they make money? How that links to security? What would be the security impact of that uh, of of an event on a given organization? Because I often find that people who focus on technology will say, "Oh, if that technology dies, the business is dead." That's never the mm-hmm. case. We've seen so many breaches in the press and also in our organization where somebody called us, "We've got a problem." There is always a way to recover. The companies will lose a lot of resources. They will lose a lot of money if they're not prepared, but they will always record, recover. So it's not like this server dies, the whole organization dies. It just doesn't work like that. Be more specific on the impact and likelihood of what you're talking about. Start to kind of plan it ahead and start thinking about it in the organization's context. Start looking at governments and governance and architecture, I mean, security architecture, so it's not technical architecture, it looks at process, people and technology and and do it more often, do it to more people and then you can become a VC. Fantastic and uh, a great way to sum up as well as a bit. Thank you so much, mate. Um, I will be knocking on your door for episode number two uh, shortly. So uh, if anybody wants any uh, further information from Zibi, I'll get all of his uh, details uh, in the description video um, below. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much for jumping on Zibi. That's great, Nick. It was great talking to you. And I suppose uh, I, I would just say I'm always open to interesting conversations, always, always open to people speaking to me, connecting over LinkedIn. One thing that I don't like is cold emails. Don't do that. I block everybody who sent me a cold email and I don't like it. If you reach out on LinkedIn, I will read it and I will respond. Perfect. Thank you so much, buddy. Take care.